our speakers, and then uh, I will disappear. By the way, I'm Fiona Galley. I'm the program director for emergency medicine at the University of Washington. Um, so we have Michael Gisandi. I've learned a little bit from Dr. Gisandi here. Uh, he's an associate professor and vice chair of education in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Council of Emergency Medicine Residency Directors. Born and raised in upstate New York, Dr. Zandi earned his Bachelor of Science from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He received his medical degree from Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine, where he was inducted into AOA. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at Stanford University, spending an additional year as chief resident. While at Stanford, he also completed a fellowship in faculty development with the Division of Emergency Medicine. He joined the faculty at Northwestern in 2003 and served as associate residency program director from 2003 to 2010, and then the residency program director until just this year of 2017, and was the medical education scholarship fellowship director from 2014 to 2017. He was a 2006 junior fellow of the Searle Center of Teaching Excellence at Northwestern, a member of the Northwestern McGaw Graduate Medical Education Committee and director of the Feinberg Academy of Medical Educators. He serves on the advisory board of Alien, Academic Life and Emergency Medicine, leading the Alien EM Match Advice Series and serving as Chief oh, Strategy oh. Officer. Yeah, you're supposed um, to read the first two sentences and be done. I'm just saying, <laughs> of the Chief Resident and Fellowship Incubators. Anyway, so we are very pleased to invite yeah, Dr. Gisandi. Okay, we also would love to join us is Dr. Jeremy Branzetti. Uh, for those who don't know him, he is the residency program director of NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency. He obtained a medical doctor at the State University of New York at Stony Brook School of Medicine in 2016. He completed residency at Northwestern University in Chicago in 2010, including his chief year resident. He joined the faculty of the Division of Emergency Medicine at the University of Washington, where we work together. And I have nothing but fantastic things to say about Dr. James Eddy. He helped us uh, establish our emergency medicine residency. Yeah. Yeah. Big interests include program branding, curriculum development, assessment, and evaluation, presentation, design, and delivery, and all things GME. So thank you very much, Jeremy Branzetti and Mike Gisandi. Okay, that was so long. <laughs> oh my God, you could have Mike and Jeremy. I saw this whole thing and I was like, my goodness. Right. I think I'm kind of <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's just move on and teach the people some stuff. That was very right. kind uh, of Theoda. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> and thanks to Cord for having us. Um, we're excited to talk about one of our favorite topics, branding, and specifically in this case, residency branding. Uh, it's really a pleasure to um, to give this webinar early in the Core Connect series as well. So thanks so much to the Core Board for letting us do this. And Jeremy, great to do another Branzandi show with you. Round three at least, if not more for us, Mike. Far more, I remember them all. All right, so listen, we're gonna switch Jeremy to print presenter mode so you don't have to, uh, so he doesn't have to look at himself anymore and he can see his slides. So why don't we do that? And let me tell everybody on our panel and those who are going to watch this recording what's going to happen for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. We're going to do a little brief introduction. We'll tell you what our objectives are for this evening, of which there are only two things that you're going to need to learn. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of branding. And then we're going to get to the meat of our um, discussion, which is going to be those two objectives. Um, and then we're going to close with a, uh, a couple of suggested activities that you could bring back to your uh, residency leadership team to take the knowledge you learned tonight and incorporate it into a faculty development or, or team development session or two for your residency leaders. And uh, then we'll close with hopefully some time for Q&A with those who are on uh, the call today. So a couple of ground rules. If you're in a loud environment, please mute your um, microphone. Uh, but if you're in a quiet enough environment, stay unmuted and you can interrupt us and ask questions. We're happy to do that. There's only um, a small group watching live. So I think that would uh, certainly enrich the conversation. Otherwise, if you want to hold your questions to the end, we can we can talk through things then. Um, we are going to watch a small six minute, less than six minute portion of a TED talk in the middle of this, which is going to be germane to our decision, uh, to our discussion tonight. So um, uh, bear with us during that, but I think it's going to uh, enrich some of our conversation as the webinar goes. So it's going to be sort of workshop style. We'll watch a little bit of uh, a TED talk together and we'll, we'll go from there. So we have a few acknowledgements to make um, as we go through our talk tonight. Uh, no disclosures, but we do want to acknowledge a couple of folks who contributed to the content or the slide design of um, our presentation tonight. Um, 
Those include one of my colleagues, Alexi Wagner, who's in the Department of Emergency Medicine. His wife, Emily Wagner, teaches in the Stanford Design School. And they shared a couple of slides on a branding talk they provide, a little bit of content. We would also like to acknowledge several co-authors of a manuscript that we have in submission right now, Jerry, my, Jeremy and myself, um, and then the folks at UFC, um, Eric Chappelle, uh, James Ahn and Chrissy Babcock, and Abra Fant and Nazim Shakri at Northwestern uh, wrote uh, a recent uh, submission on, on a paper that may or may not be called residency branding. So uh, some of the content for tonight's talk does um, need to get attributed to them. Absolutely. And uh, and then we're going to kind of spend a little bit of time introing this with my favorite slide, the coffee slide. Now, Jeremy, I don't see you in in presenter mode. I see, I see your regular screen. Do others see the presenter mode? How about how about now? Now I do. All right. All right. So why is it that I walk past the corner Seven Eleven? and walk to the Starbucks pretty much every day and spend a whole lot of money on my Starbucks coffee that Jeremy has in his hand. Why did you do it today, Jeremy? You could have bought coffee from any number of those little hot dog carts outside of NYU. Why did you go to Starbucks? Because I know exactly what I'm getting every time and I know what I want and I know what I like. Excellent, great. So same thing for me, consistency in product is a very important part of brand development. Brands really are a reflection of your values and your decisions as the leaders of whatever organization, be it the CEO of Starbucks, the CEO of Green Mountain Coffee. Now you've got a little bit of values driven uh, corporate um, lingo and, and personality to Green Mountain. You sort of watch that commercial on TV. I don't even have Green Mountain Coffee, but you know if you buy Green Mountain Coffee, you're going to help the people in Peru make the coffee on the mountain, just like in the commercial, right? And there are certainly um, corporations where you know if you buy shoes from Tom, somebody's going to get some free shoes somewhere in the world because that's what they do, right? You know that um, Starbucks is going to have a very consistent brand everywhere in the world that you go. You're going to taste very similar coffee. And for me, my morning coffee is something that I don't want to risk. I'm going to walk right past the 7-Eleven. I'm going to go to the corporation that I know is going to fulfill my expectation. And if you can match the values that drive your decisions in your organization, we'll take it back to residencies, with the brand experience, which I'm gonna de define for you in a little while, the, the customer, customer user experience. If you can match those um, smartly, you're gonna get people to be loyal to your brand. And, and that's what we're gonna try to teach you how to do tonight, how to audit what you're doing and, and create brand loyalty. So um, why does this matter? Jeremy, why does it matter? Because, like it or not, the perception that people have of you, your program, who you are, whatever it is that you're bringing, it's reality. It may not be what you want them to think or it's what you try to have them think, but that's just how it is. And that's the world that we live in. Yeah, so there's a really um, tough quote that we're going to share with you from uh, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. And, and that's your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And that's really tough, but that is what we deal with as program directors, right? We, we may have students come visit our programs as uh, a visiting student for uh, a month, and, and you know others come and visit us for five or six hours on interview day, and then they leave, and other people influence their impression of us, their brand image of what we're all about. And, and it's what they say when we're not around and not controlling the message that really determines our brand on a national uh, stage. So this is a really tough and uncomfortable quote, right? But it's, but it's reality. This is what we have to deal with. So we're here tonight not to, to teach you how to market in a dirty way or to misrepresent yourself, but rather to build or rebuild your program or design your curriculum from the ground up in a values-driven way that's going to give a consistent product to your consumers and will define who those are in a moment. And from that, create brand loyalty in folks who over and over and over know what you you are all about, what your organization's all about, what your residency program is all about. That's tonight's overall goals. So Jeremy will share our objectives and we'll kind of get into it. Yeah, so let's let's hone this in as good educators as we'd like to, like to be. We just really wanted to stick to two main points today. We've talked about branding in many different ways, but tonight it's about branding you and your program, why you want to do that, and how, how to do that. So first, we're going to define that term. What is residency branding? translating that businessy concept to what we do day in, day out. 
And then we'll discuss the key elements of what is a brand audit and what goes into making the entire, the entire process of your brand and how to make sure you're hitting the mark as you want to. Now, yeah, so to test your own gap knowledge, if you can do a brand audit right now, you should stop watching. Yeah, you don't know how to do a brand audit, by the end of the hour, you'll know how to do a brand audit. That is exactly correct. But we're banking on the fact that because we were just as uncertain about this a couple years ago when we first got into the, interested in this, most people are going to be fairly new and fairly uh, uh, not as experienced with this. So why do we bother discussing this? I mean, that's the first question. We're all a bunch of scientists slash do-gooders who want to run a residency, just make good residents and have good to have, enjoy that experience. And we don't, it just feels inherently weird to go into this idea of a brand or these businessy concepts. But we have to acknowledge a couple of realities here. Just simple as the world is, you're a brand. You already are. Whether you want to consider yourself as such or use that terminology, doesn't matter. You are a brand, like you're not. There's going to be a message about who you are that's out there amongst students, rotators, interviewee candidates, your residents, alumni, people who have heard about your program from about 10 years ago when they were a resident or maybe interviewed there before you were even at where you are. But no matter what, there's a message, and either you're going to control it or you're going to be subject to it. But ultimately, you have a target audience. You will determine who those are, and we'll talk about the different, many different uh, denominations of an audience in a moment, but they need to hear a message. It's going to hear a message. Make sure it's yours. So consider these situations in a moment. See if any of these apply to you. Are you by chance a new PD taking over a program or new in, in, into, the, into your area? Is your program in need of a bit of a culture change? This is something that uh, ultimately we all, it, probably at some point we want to change something in our programs, but facing up to that's not very easy. Is there a residency crisis going on? All, and inevitably that will happen for us at some point during our tenure in program leadership. And I, I don't know about you, but for most people I've met, the funding is exactly growing on trees right now for residency education. So if you're trying to develop something special for your program, I think a lot of us are starting to realize the potential of an alumni fundraising network. To do that, you need to know exactly what you're going to appeal to for your alumni, and they're going to have to have a great vision or memory or experience of what your brand or residency was for them. So let's look into that point before I made about who are your consumers. Well, the one we've we said already a couple times are students with, in, when it comes to residency recruitment. You're going to have applicants who come, who apply, then come through, and then decide about your program in terms of where their future lies. There's the prospective faculty and churches. I'm going to say when I changed jobs here, that was absolutely part of the consideration of, well, what is the residency? And my bet is many other people, if they're joining an academic group, the residency and your program is going to be a part of their decision to be made. The public and their desire for patient satisfaction, high quality care, low, low cost, cost care, all of this is going to stem from the training you give your, your residents. How is your chair once it's a lot of money to you? Are you on point with your needs? Are you filling out your citizenship needs? Are you pointing a picture, to the, to, painting a picture to your chair as to why this idea or initiative you have matters and that it fits in line with what the, the department and residency goals are? And the same goes for your DIO. Are you Johnny on the spot who's getting all of your materials in on time or they have to come pester you for your annual program review and what do you think they're going to think of your brand based on those two scenarios? So, so that brings me to why. So I'm going to kick it over back over to Mike here to talk about a little more in depth about the actual process of branding. Yeah, so our, our objectives were specific, define the branding uh, uh, definition of, of residence branding, and then discuss the key elements of brand audit. So if you advance the figure um, that follows, Jeremy, uh, we're going to credit uh, Dr. Chappelle from U of C for this figure, uh, and the conceptual framework is one from uh, Simona Boddy, um, who is a branding and marketing expert out of the UK. Um, this is a really nice figure. This is a figure of a brand audit. These are the steps of a brand audit. We're going to define all of the words on the screen, inclusive, first, of residency branding. So, so branding in and of itself is taking a set of characteristics or values and using those to differentiate yourself from your competition or your peers um, and to create a product that's relevant for some consumer base. And once you do that, um, you can uh, position your brand between two very important groups, the stakeholders of your leadership team who is going to drive the mission and vision of your organization based on their own inherent values or their brand identity, as we're going to talk about, but, but position that between the consumers who will have a brand experience, in this case, applicants to your program or actually the residents who experience your curriculum. And then lastly, 
uh, the folks who have some external perception of your program. In this figure, applicants who think something about your program on the interview trail, and it's germane to the, to the timeline that we're in right now, being interview season, but also, and importantly, their advisors, right? Think of all of the advisors around the country who have um, an opinion about your program having never visited that program themselves, right? So let's take each of these terms and talk a little bit more about them. First is brand identity. And I'll say brand identity is what you and your leadership team think about yourselves. It's your own personal identity about an organization. So it's the values and the, the vision that you as a program director have for the type of candidate that you wanna take into your program, grow, train, and put out into the world. What is the outcome that you're trying to um, achieve? And I think medical schools, and certainly WMC and, and the ACGME to some degree, have recognized that differentiation is really important. At one time, it was just um, enough to train physicians and put them out into the marketplace. And I think that in and of itself is a very, very noble goal. But I think you can think about two different types of medical schools out there, and the deans and the WMC get this, and they're, they're working to differentiate themselves more and more. There are those schools, perhaps, that are, are entirely driven to train physician scientists, that they want to put folks out who will um, be able to compete for NIH money, who are able to answer important questions, advance human health, um, advance science, and um, change uh, the course of, of uh, humanity in that in that way. And those are important things. We have to cure disease. Someone has to cure cancer. Someone has to cure HIV. Where do they go to school? That's very different than perhaps um, a strategically built rural medical school who is trying to put out state-of-the-art providers who are expertly trained at providing care in rural or austere environments that exist in big swaths of their state where there just aren't physicians. Right, both very valid reasons to exist, but very, very different reasons for being. And it's that reason for being that you should challenge your leadership team with. I tell students that I advise who go out on the interview trail, when you leave the interview day, you go out on the sidewalk and you think, why does that program exist? If you can't answer the question, that's kind of a red flag to me because it means many of the decisions they're making that are about their curriculum and the experience, in this case, brand experience, which we keep coming back to these terms, that, that they've created for their learners um, is one that's not values driven, is one that's not mission driven. So brand identity drives all of your strategic decisions. And we have a really nice video that we're gonna show that's less than six minutes long that's gonna drive this point home. So this is um, a, a portion of a TED talk that you can watch um, in its entirety online by Simon Simek. He's um, a marketing and branding expert. And I'm gonna let him uh, do the talk. And Jeremy, if you wanna just hit play. All right, so we'll come back in about six minutes from now. Oh, sorry about that. Here we go. There's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way. And it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it. Would you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP? But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. So let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? 
Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients to do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision-making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information, like features and benefits and facts and figures, it just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision-making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you. Those aren't the other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision-making and not language. So I, I think that's like the perfect six minutes to sum up the approach you should take during interview season. And um, yeah, we, we have slide credit here for Alexi Wagner, but Jeremy, let's just like unpack the circles, right? So what is the what that everybody in the country talks about? We, the what is residency training or great residency training. Right. So, so if I'm the applicant, you're the program director and you use this Apple analogy, right? Like we make beautiful computers. Do you want to buy one? What is the most common thing you hear on, uh, on interview day if you're the applicant? We make leaders. We make leaders. Who says we make leaders? You all listening, you raise your hand, you've said it. I was going to say, we all say it. <laughs> oh my God. So Fiona, let me tell you what my experience was um, a really long time ago in Galaxy Far Away. When I interviewed at 14 residencies, too many, too many interview students, 14 residencies coast to coast, and at every single shop I heard, we train leaders in emergency medicine. And for a while I was like, well, that's really compelling. 
And then at the end, I thought, this is remarkable sampling bias because the followers must train somewhere. I just happen to not pick any of those places, <laughs> right, on the trail. It shows <laughs> how easy it is. If you can take anything away from tonight's presentation, just just dismiss that line because it, it doesn't resonate with the consumers. The applicants hear it over and over again. So think about the middle of the circle, the why, right? What makes you different and special yet relevant to your consumer? And these are the values and the characteristics. Um, Jeremy, if you, if you advance the slide to the next set of circles, um, give me an example of a good why. Higher order purpose and benefit. We make people who change the world. We make people who change the world. Absolutely. The how, we have resources that allow us to do a parallel scholarly track curriculum that is specific to fill in the blank in the way that you want to change the world. We just happen to train emergency medicine residents. Come change the world with us. That's really great. That's and perfect. And Mike, there's so many other ways to do that, right? Like the whole point of this, this is it's not just a bland platitude of we make leaders, we make great, great clinicians to do what, where, how, what, yes. in what way. You can change that that same we make uh, people change the world to we make the doctors who will work no, where nobody else will. There's your rural uh, program that, that sends their people and has a track record of staffing nowhere, at least in the state where nowhere else will go. Uh, at my own program, the, uh, when I came here just recently, eight months ago, it became abundantly clear what's in the DNA of this program is social uh, causes and emergency medicine and the role that EM plays in that. And everywhere has something like this. And you just have to be willing to say specifically, this is what we do. We're not everything to everyone. We do this. Exactly. And, and Simon Sinek says this in that um, six minute video clip, right? It's speaking relevance to your consumer base. So. Sometimes the only common characteristic that you have with the program down the street is your geography, right? Sometimes the programs who have the same values as you or want to put out the same product, the same learning outcome, they aren't geographically anywhere near you. And if you start to think about who are my peer institutions, people go, oh, it's the program down the street. But sometimes the program down the street isn't the one you're really competing with, if competing is the, is the correct word, and it is in a consumer base. You're really thinking who's like me around my region or the country and and how do I put myself into that bucket and then within it find a distinguishing characteristic that makes me novel or special or relevant to that consumer? So, so this is sort of the, the why out part of the circle for residency recruitment. Don't just say we train leaders, we train the most skilled doctors you can, you know, every applicant says the same thing to you, right? What do you want out of residency? I want to be the best trained doctor I can be. That's completely um land and it's the same as every other student they need to tell you something different to get you to listen otherwise it's just you know 150 students saying the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. so so we're gonna spend the most time on that concept that brand identity concept what are the values that drive your mission um, and your vision and how does that unfold into your curriculum and your experience but let's cover a couple of the other definitions then we'll we'll sort of open it up to some discussion the next is brand image so if brand identity is about you Brand image is what other people think of you, right? This is the Jeff Bezos um, quote. So brand image is the external perception about you, whether it's valid or not. And this is the part that really hurts, right? So you're gonna have um, students coming in and out of your shop in the next few months who were sent there by faculty who have an opinion about you that they shared, even though those faculty members may never have visited your program, they don't know who runs it, they certainly don't know the name of your chair or the last time the PD switched, they know nothing about you, but they're like, yeah, that's a good program, or that's a bad program, right? This happens all the time. And students will, um, will also give each other that fits similar information. You know, at the breakfast in the morning before they go into interviews, they're talking about the place across town that they were at yesterday. And perhaps there's that one really loud mouth student who's telling all the other students what to think. And it's got to be so frustrating for your best friend who runs the program down the street who can't control that message anymore. But, but it's reality, right? Like brand perception equals reality. It is reality. So you have to understand the factors that drive the brand image. Some of them are messaging from you. Some of them are messaging from external parties. Some of them are the, simply the circumstances in which you need to recruit that year. Maybe there's a scandal, maybe morale is low, maybe there's leadership change. Whatever your circumstances drives the image of your program, whether the actual clinical shift changed at all, probably not, right? And what is the worst culprit? 
Jeremy, what is the worst culprit for brand image for us? Oh, the old doctor and blogging. Oh my gosh. So student doctor, I mean, it's no, it's no uh, secret that I'm not the greatest fan of this resource. I mean, I think it does some good for some students, but, but in the anonymity of some of the posts about programs and program directors who are my friends who are running great shops, you read the stuff that's written and you're like, that is just insane. And, and it's certainly coming from people who perhaps have some knowledge, but, but maybe have no knowledge whatsoever. And it creates this cycle of confusion on the interview trail that you know, I think we as, um, as a community need to just stop all of that, that advising, that nonsense, it's just terrible. And Mike, I mean, I'll, I'll even say, I remember very distinctly, I was in school uh, here in New York, and I was beginning to take the idea of maybe I'm gonna leave and go somewhere away and try this grand adventure. I looked at the Chicago programs, and what did I see about Northwestern everywhere in studentdoctor.net? Yeah, we only treat rich people. It's all you, yeah. That's all you heard about when I worked in North Carolina. Over and over and over again. And that, without having ever been there, known someone from there, or uh, had any advising about that, that absolutely colored my view. And to the point where, because I was, when I was in Chicago, I almost didn't enjoy the, uh, the first interview enough. I just thought of like leaving the city before I went to my, North, my interview with Northwestern. Yeah. It almost had that of impact because I figured, well, what's the point? And thankfully, in my instance, that wasn't the case, but this has a real impact on people. These are things that they're hearing, saying, perceiving, that you have no control or little control over and have to deal with it. So don't just throw your hands up. Let's talk about some skills to, um, to help you slowly control this message. So, so taking the brand identity, which is what you and your team think about your program, and the brand image, what other people think about your program, and trying to make those expectations mean realities, that's brand positioning, right? It's the deliberacy um, of your actions. It's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's taking time on interview data to make sure someone greets them and that they have a schedule with names and emails that they can contact people again, yeah, that they yeah. get, that they're on, everything's on time and it's, it's as you told them that it would be and they leave on time so they get their flight and you make yourself available to them if they have a question. And then when they get there, those residents, you deliver on the promises of interview day, right? You have to make sure that the experience matches what you told them that it would be and, and feel badly if you're not delivering on that and make sure that they're involved in the process of getting to that point. That's brand positioning. That's taking um, the product and making it center stage and, and ignoring the misperceptions and the misguided um, elements. And, out there. and Mike, this is an important part here because Going back to the example of your brand identity, if you try to be everything to everyone, frankly, you obviously can't do it all. And when they get to your program and think they can do anything or everything is available to them and realize it's not true, you're inherently going to have dissatisfied residents that you're gonna to have to rescue that to make better for the rest of their time. Whereas if you're abundantly clear about what you do and even what you don't do, then people who come to your program know exactly what they're there for and are not surprised when you tell them, hey, uh, maybe I can't uh, have you go do away rotations or go do a big career in global health because it's just not what our resources are here yeah. or anything similar to that. Whereas if we kind of fudge that and there was the, the statement in the recruiting time, we pay for it. So if, if brand positioning is really focusing on that product, brand experience is the consumer's interaction with that product. So the product is your curriculum. It is your interview day. It is your clinical shift. You can fill in the blank, right? Uh, the experience is those who consume those things, how they interact with the product. It's it's a little bit of an overlap of what I said, but they they certainly are distinct elements within branding. You you can't um, create a brand out of nothing. You actually have to have a substantive rotation to make that rotation have an excellent experience for the students who are learning on that rotation, right? So you have to put in the blood, sweat, and tears to to create and design the wonderful curriculum that is your residency. And then you manage your brand by making sure that you're hitting all the metrics that allow you some comfort in knowing that the people that are going through your curriculum are getting what, what you talk about. So this is um, their experience. It's very emotional. It's very um, effective. This is where morale plays into your um, interview season. If people are happy, they're talking in a positive way about their, their own personal experience with this brand. It's the user experience, the consumer experience. Um, and you know, lots of consumers were talked about at the beginning. We keep focusing on residency interviews and, and interview season that's coming up, but you know, how did your alumni experience it? How do your faculty experience your program? How do the leadership in your hospital experience your program when you're looking for 
resources for your program? I think those are important questions. And a really great example of um, just the best brand experience in the country. Another shout out again in the Branzandi show to Jan and our friends, uh, Totally <laughs> Jelly, right, at LA County. Uh, this is a, the perfect example, Code Black's the perfect example of brand experience, right? Because one of her residents um, who had an experience in film created a documentary about his experience. And you saw his view of LA County through his eyes as a consumer of that brand, right? You knew all about C Booth and you knew all about the resident project at the end. He even put a map of all the county hospitals in the country because his experience was, you know, this is the way to train people, right? That is a values decision. He believed in the messaging of that value system so much that he put a map at the end of the documentary about where the other county programs were in the country. So that's a beautiful example. I mean, and and in terms of branding and marketing, come on, Jan, you win. It, 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 it's fantastic. <laughs> I, want, I want a movie. Come on. Right? <laughs> and, you know, none of that is data based, right? There's not. This isn't about outcomes or like factual things or patient satisfaction. Any of these numbers driven things. This is all about somebody who believed in what they what their experience was and showed others why they should believe in it too. And obviously, you don't need a bunch of um, filmmakers in your residency to be able to deliver a great um, uh, brand experience, uh, a reflection of a great brand experience. There's lots of ways that you can involve your residents on interview day, and alumni interviewers, and all sorts of things to reflect on their own experience. So we bring this all together with brand audit, which is the final word to be defined. I keep talking about the skill set of brand audit. And for those who are uncomfortable with marketing and branding, um, and you really want to live in a medical education world, think about brand auditing as program evaluation, just done in a different way, right? If you create a curriculum that's simply keeping the lights on, how do you know that anybody actually learned anything, right? You could be so hyper-focused on making sure everyone's there by the start of conference and that they don't leave and that they get their 70% conference attendance and all the process stuff can be overwhelming sometimes and you forget, did they actually learn anything when they were at conference, right? That's, that's to some degree program evaluation. If you do brand auditing as a, as a way or a, a schema for um, program evaluation, you start to think, what was the, the reason that I chose to be a PD to begin with? Why did I start my program or why did I change it in this way? Did I create the curriculum that actually can deliver the learning outcome I said that I would deliver? And then how do I measure that I'm actually delivering it, right? This is where I think the Pratt survey is really great for me. I, I kind of like reading the Pratt because I could tinker with my curriculum and I could think about like, how did that change the outcome? How was, how did the, um, the brand experience of the consumers of my brand, my grads and their employers, how did, how did that get influenced? So if you take to the next slide um, and look at this sort of figure, uh, once again, um, uh, as sort of a, an overview, I think it kind of comes together, right? Your leadership team talks about themselves, their identification, their brand identity. The image is other people's imagery about you, whether it's true or not, I like imagery, right? Uh, whether it's true or not, so their perceptions, your brand position is when you try to take expectations and reality and bring them together to deliver a brand experience that's authentic and, and perhaps metric driven. That's brand audit. If you can take those couple of things, you can do a brand audit. And so I, I really harp on what Mike just said there about the idea of aligning these things. If you really look at what was, what was mentioned here, you have the start of what you, your program leadership, your department, whoever the stakeholders are that give a damn about your program will have a brand identity. There is a mission, there's a vision, there are values, there's, there, is, there is core beliefs. That needs to align with what your program actually does. Program aims, which is now a new piece of our lexicon due to the self-study, just is it a way of saying the program elements, the program foci. What, do you, what are you actually executing through your program? Is it critical care time? Is it a three versus four year program? Is it in working, uh, rotating mostly county, most, mostly community, mostly tertiary academic? putting time in research, et cetera. There's all these options that would then stream from your identity to what you actually put in place. And then as Mike said, what are the outcomes to make sure that you're hitting the mark for what you said you're doing? And this is sort of the alignment of brand identity, brand, uh, uh, brand image, and then what the, the positioning and experience will lead out to be in the measurable outcomes. Yeah, and this so, allows us to differentiate our programs. This is exactly what the ACGME wants you to do. If your program doesn't, program A doesn't look like program B in any values or characteristics, don't write the same aims as program B, right? Like that, that's a problem in the self-study. The ACGME wants 
programs to appeal to different uh, students and they want different outcomes. So that's, that's a key thing. And you know, my last comment about that last slide, brand identity to program aims to outcomes, that's a 10 year longitudinal initiative that I urge you all to do. I urge you to sit down with your program leadership. I urge you to talk about your values and your mission and recreate the program that, that best authentically represents those things and then measure the heck out of it and refine it and iterate. And 10 years later, you're gonna have this thing, right? So that speaks to a little bit of the stability of your team, the stability of your resources. When you're ready to do this, this isn't what you need. When you're building your team, it's hard to do this. It's once your team is there and set and you're ready to go, and then give yourself a five to 10 year timeline and then measure it again. These are not activities you do in the next four weeks while you get ready for the applicants to come. Absolutely it's not. a long, long period of time. It can begin now, but really you're never gonna deliver on that promise until many, many years from now. And All right, you know, did we meet our objectives, Jeremy? We're, yeah. What? Yeah, Oops, what they are. <laughs> uh, yeah, we absolutely, I, I'd like to think that we did. Our objectives, as remember what we set forth before, we wanted to define what the term residency branding is. A residency brand, just to reiterate here, is a set of values and notable characteristics that define an organization, differentiate it from its competitors, and make it relevant to specific target audiences. And then we went into the elements of a, of a brand audit and how that comes together in that image that we, we showed a few times. You have your brand identity, which is your internal intrinsic values based on the people who run the leadership of your program. The brand image, the external perception of what your program is. Positioning is how you align those two. And then the experience is the actual sort of the, the amygdala level experience, uh, 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 experience for lack of a better term, that, that your, your consumers, whomever they be, have and how they associate with in, your, in their head who you are. And when you get that all in alignment is when you hit the nail on the head. It's what I feel when I walk into Starbucks. <laughs> and I pay $5 for the extra two shots that go in my coffee. All right. Uh, a few resources yeah. and then we'll take some questions. That's right. So we, so for those of you who have seen the Brenzati show before, we like to do seminar based uh, approaches and workshops. And we wanted to give you a couple of exercises that we found really work well for this. For the beginning of identifying your brand identity, we recommend this. If you try and get your team together and then sequentially go down, can your leadership team starting from the top to bottom from name a vision, can the PD, then the APD's chair, and then your trainees, et cetera, on downward, can everybody recite that? Then you're nailing it. If not, then that's a sign that everybody isn't quite in alignment and your identity isn't set. Similarly, you can have an exercise where you really do work on, and I can't stress enough what Mike said, of getting everybody out of the daily grind and really digging into this, your program's mission and vision. Figure out if when everybody sits and writes them, are they the same with each other? How they rel are relative to your competition, again, or nearby programs, however you want to say that. This isn't meant to be truly a competitive experience. Uh, and on that same note, if you were to be able to then make an exercise where you write down all of your team members, what makes your, your program great? Your curriculum, your program, however you want to call it, compare. And if those aren't all in alignment together or with the vision or mission, then you probably have to revisit this and figure out what is out of sync and how to bring it all together. And then finally, a good exercise is, is what are the key mark elements of how do you market, how, how do you work on your external brand perception and to who you need to market next year. Uh, and then sharing with your team the best practices from your examples and what are the main sticking points between what you've all come up with. So with that, a few exercises that you can take away and do with your team, we'd like to uh, end the talk now and turn it over to, the, to everybody for questions. I have a question, unless okay. anybody else has a question. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I could see this as being um, kind of difficult to swallow for some of the program leadership uh, to sit down at a table and kind of look at the the whole of the residency and see where things are going. Is is there an easy method of approaching this with all the leadership and kind of not trying to be? I'm a new faculty at UNC and trying not to be kind of too abrasive or saying. Hey, we should revisit our all of our mission, all of our visions, and and see if we're in line with that. I mean, I've had a wonderful time here so far. I think it's a fantastic place. But um. <laughs> it is go go Tar Heels. All right, so Daniel, I I just did this with your alma mater like a couple of weeks ago. So imagine this: we're all in a conference room. You know, the, you know who I'm talking about. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we had a really nice session about. Um, you know, who are we? 
these, these are my favorite uh, questions from a Jesuit retreat years ago, right? Who are we? What are we doing? What do we want to become by our actions? And then we drill down from these big meta questions to very specific things. The what do we want to become by our actions are learning outcomes. You know, as we um, think about the program and its graduates, what skill sets should they be able to do? Learning outcomes are what, what should the grad be able to, to do? Can they do a task? Not just, you know, can they answer a question on a test? Can they do a task? And now let's map that. Do some curriculum mapping back to your actual conference or didactic or rotation grid and, and say, like, do we have a, a specific way that we teach it? And if we don't, we have to change that. Right. And if we do, how do we know that we're teaching it well? What is the metric? Let's create some metrics around this. Right. You could do this um, for hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks, depending how granular you want to get. But sometimes you just start meta with those three big questions and you come back and say, all right, well, we're only going to focus on procedural experience this year. Next year, we're only going to focus on the resident scholarly activity. The following year, we're only going to focus on wellness and just pick apart little pieces and then break them down into very granular ways to measure things. But I think if people don't think about the data and they don't think about this process is, is program evaluation, you're right. The, the residency leadership is they're scientists, they're educators, they're not marketers. This isn't about marketing. This is about linking reality with what you want reality to be. That's really what branding is. Yeah. Um, and it's all the stuff in between that might have a marketing bent to it, but but it's creating the grad you want and making sure that they experience what you wanted them to experience. Yeah, so as, so as a new faculty member, I guess one of the things I could recommend, because you're coming into a new culture and people are going to be highly invested in what that culture is. And I get your point of making a suggestion of change carries with the implicit statement of what you're doing is wrong. And you don't, of course, want to come across like that. So what Mike's point where he really got into, and this may take a little time to set this up to have a good objective discussion is, measuring the things that your program says it's doing now to see if you're actually doing it because if that's the case then you maybe you actually don't need to change and maybe this is just something that you feel like is you know there's two ways to get to the end but they're doing their job my bet is if you sense this as an outsider and you have fresh eyes compared to them my bet is if you measure the right thing you'll be able to show that they're not hitting them hitting the mark that they think they are you know i i tried to work on um, the brand positioning, we keep using our words that we learned tonight, brand positioning in Northwestern for years, but probably the, the time that I enjoyed thinking about it and talking about it with my colleagues the most was when we were writing our self-study aims and going through that initial first um, couple of steps of the self-study process, because that is is really very authentic, right? I, I mean, if you're writing aims that are just so generic that you can't differentiate yourself from the program down the street, then, I, I mean, I don't know, I just, I think then you're wasting everyone's time. But if you go through that process, you know, if, if that hasn't happened yet, maybe start there because then you can begin to think, well, this is what differentiates us, why, how, and then measure that. Yeah. But it all starts back with the why, right? The inner, the inner part of the circle, like why did you even choose to be a program director? Let's just begin with that and unfold from there. Yeah, you know, awesome. Thank you so question. much. You yeah, yeah, glad you joined us. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you can think of a great example of where there was a perception issue with a program and how they turned it around. So if you could give a, you know, an example that you can pull from, from maybe recent experience, it would be really helpful. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how, uh, how fair an example this is. I'm just going to speak from experience. I don't want to talk about other people's programs, but I'll, I'll talk about the other program that I worked for just now. So what else <laughs> but I, you know, I, I think it was a really great program and we made it different in very valid ways. And, um, and I think that those differences were felt in certain metrics. Those differences were felt in uh, perhaps the experience on interview day. And frankly, our, our change over the years, occurred in parallel with the change of a number of Chicago programs in different ways over the years. And I remember as I left Chicago and I chatted with other PDs, I felt like emergency medicine in Chicago was in, in kind of a nice heyday. Like all the programs seemed to be doing really, really well. And um, they were kind of different. I mean, they are kind of different yeah. and different in good ways. But, but, you know, I watched that happen over a long period of time. I remember when we um, we're making a lot of changes. You know, I met another person making a lot of changes. For years, I would hear candidates come in and be like, 
this program seems like you know it's it's uh, changing the right time up and up. It's like a you know it's it's gonna be great someday. And I was like, it's been around <laughs> since 1973, right? But it took a while to deliver on all those changes to be able to point back and say like, look what we did the last five years. Here's the data, and then it, it resonated differently. So I'm gonna use that as a very safe space. <laughs> Sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, you have one? Uh, I mean, the I, I don't think I can think of a program that specifically changed who they are, but I think it's more about um, uh, acknowledging and adapting who they are. I'll, I'll leave them as nameless, but we, we've actually used this example before where when we asked some of our, our friend programs to uh, let us use them in, in, in a talk, and one program has a reputation for being a place where quote unquote, they work you hard. And that was well known. Nobody has ever either rotated there or worked there. And that can be taken as, oh, you're, you can see that in a negative way of, mm -hmm. well, then this is a place that's just using me for labor or that I'm just going to be you know, ground down while I'm there and I'm not going to have time. There's so many negative perceptions of that. That program sees this as a positive. And they see this as the person who see, hears that and says, I want to be in this is the person who's going to work their butt off for them and is going to come out the other end exactly the way they want to. If they try to appeal and sound like, well, it's not that hard or no, people make it up more than it is, then they're going to recruit people who don't actually abide by their work ethic. And then, then yeah, they may do better with what their rank list was or maybe they get people that come from better schools or whatever it is, but their outcome, their true outcome is going to suffer for it. I, I can't agree enough. Jeremy, that you know, if you are, um, in, you know, in the same geographic area, and your program requires that everybody gets a PhD and does bench research, and a program across town doesn't, and you are losing candidates to that program, you shouldn't downplay the fact that you offer a PhD, right? Like, like that's a fanciful example, but, but you know, you can't ignore the thing that you're about. So just right. embrace it and hope that you find 15 lovely people who also embrace it to come be your interns every year. It's a more authentic process, right? Yeah. It takes all the crazy competition away. Like you're only looking for those people who are going to succeed in your program. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on what you do and why, if anything, the sale is why the way that you choose to do it, why having a PhD in residency is important and why you should, somebody should do that. 80% well, a PhD, I'm sure, would be like 98%. People won't buy that pitch. But you get the idea. <laughs> you make sure you reach that 2%, you're going to get exactly the people you want for that and not people who are dropping out of your PhD program or washing out or whatever. So that is entirely the way it's this example I just walked out. <laughs> Any other Any questions? Other? From the group? Oh, sorry, Fiona. Oh, I was just going to ask for questions. None from me, thanks. Um, Abbas has a question. His mic isn't working right now, so he's going to type it out. Okay. So just give him one moment. We will come in here. No pressure, Abbas. I can't see the question, so I'm so excited to laugh. We're all pausing on a live I know. I, I, tell a story or something while we're waiting for this to happen. Well, it's so funny because you right, you can't see the typing even, so it's bad sort of TV, like we've <laughs> grown accustomed to the ellipsis on our phones. Yeah, right? Well, like, clearly, clearly our MDs do not prepare us for no. hosting or Appropriate video. So yeah. apologies to everybody. Yeah, you know, it's got to be written by now, right? Let's just. <laughs> uh, you know, so just as uh, for us on the organizational side, uh, it may, it, it, depending if people choose to send a message to the organizer or the organizer and panelist, it may not show up in our window. It may just only show up on Tina's side. Yeah. Or Fiona's side for that matter. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything yet. Tina, do you see anything? Uh, no, he got his mic working. So, Abbas, we could hear you. Uh, so you can ask the question. All right. Hopefully. Oh, Abbas. 
Oh, he typed it too. It says, not the question you're waiting for, but aside from visiting rotators, interviewing day, how else do you spread your brand? Oh, ah. that's from Kevin. Sorry, Kevin. I've got some ideas. Jeremy, what do you what do you have? So I think the first step is to be able to make sure consider everybody that your program touches in some way and or what you're focusing on, right? There's a very big difference between what is your brand to your institution who may not clinically rotate through you, but you're going to interface with. Are you the residents? Are you, are you is your res, your residency the brand that shows up early, stays in late, represents your program, or are they the ones who are, you know, they catch their 10 babies and they're trying to leave their OB rotation as quick as they can? Right? That's going to be part of their brand, and that, that goes into that group of people that they go to. If you want to really focus, I guess, on your the main people that you're going to be with, I, I think one of the, the biggest ones are your residents. And that example, I think, highlights that. Your residents are your advertising. We're not going to buy TV space or logo space, or we're not going to try and get spokesmen to be able to show how why you should care about why our, what our program is. Your residents are those people. They are the... There was a not, uh, something we, in the midst of preparing this, that, should, that talked about how in a nonprofit, your workers are your advertisers. They have to be the ones who believe heart and soul and why they're there and what they're doing. And as long as that's the case, as long as that's aligned, their actions will represent that. You don't have to tell them what to say. You don't have to direct them. You don't have to monitor them. If they are aligned and they buy into why you exist and why you're there and why they're there, then they are your interface. They are your branding and your marketing from that point out. Um, it used to be presentations at meetings and papers your faculty wrote drove your reputation. I think that still matters greatly, but also social media and blogging, a lot of residencies get the word out in that manner now that's different than it used to be. Um, I think uh, to some degree you have to get the, the student to apply and you have to do a little bit of an audit of uh, who applies to your program and who do you match. And if there are places that just never, you know, if you have a school that never sends you students as applicants, you have to ask yourself why that is, you know, and and is there something about the advising they're getting, and can you can you uh, message to those people, right, to the faculty that drive the applicants to your programs? I mean, that, that's important too. So yeah, thinking people, the way they hear about you is more than just your website. Yeah, I remember Mike showed me that. Now? The brand news invites. Uh -huh. I'm hearing somebody. All right, there we go. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Fiona, Mike, and Jeremy. Thanks for taking time. This is a boss from Staten Island. Um, uh, I'm in the, I'm in the Amtrak on the way to ASAP, so uh, <laughs> hopefully getting some hangups here. Um, but the question I had was, um, being part of a program that's uh, part of a large system uh, with the consolidation going on in healthcare around the United States and especially in academics. Um, we face some challenges in that the brand message that's put out by the larger system um, may not be the same that our smaller hospital and smaller residency have. Um, and so some of the challenges, you know, they changed their names a few times. So it went from, I can say it doesn't matter. Uh, it was, um, we were a Staten Island program, then we were the Northwell Staten Island program, then we were the Hofstra Northwell Staten Island program, and next year we're going to be the Zucker College Hofstra Staten Island program. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's challenging in itself and retaining your identity. Um, but what challenge? Um, how do you guys see negotiation? I don't maybe you guys don't face it because you're at you know kind of sole academic places, um, but challenging the of putting out your message to the trainees and to others that you know we're not the mothership or we're not that place we're different mm -hmm. so very quick on mine i can imagine you know you you of course have to be careful with what your messaging is that gets external to your program into your greater institution and not just institution but the the mothership the the whole organization right you have to be careful with the specifics you see there but I, I would say that when you have the, the candidates in front of you, you're in the room with them, you have a certain amount of leeway to be able to paint the picture that you want to be. If you want to be the smaller, more family-like program, you can say that. And you, you, can, you can say things that are sort of, for lack of a better term, orthogonal to what the, the, the branded message is that comes out for, uh, for, for your grander 
as long as you're not saying that something that flies in the face of it or that would you know, directly contradict it, I think that's okay. But that's the that's that's the that's the challenge to, to carefully navigate that. I, I think one thing just to add to what Jeremy was just saying is I think when you're part of a mothership program, it's really important to align with your mothership about the messaging that they also give to people because. There's advantages and disadvantages of being a big program, a big organization, and and that's one opportunity for you to really have the organization also take part of, in this brand audit in the brand messaging. Yeah, it, it it would be silly not to capitalize on the resources that come with the different health system that you're in. Also, like uh, you know, marketing 101, you shouldn't mess with your logo if all the logos look the same, and you make a different logo. <laughs> that's confusing, right? Like, look at Fiona's W. That's a very characteristic purple W that only one school has. If she right. went and made a completely different logo with a bunch of, like, squiggly EKG lines and hearts and a bunch of nonsense, and, and it doesn't look like a very recognizable NCAA symbol, then what is the point of that logo? It, it shares nothing of value. So to some degree, you have to play to, to, the, to the big mothership. But, you know, you can differentiate in lots of subtle brand experience on interview day sort of ways that Jared pointed out. Right, our, our issue becomes, the trainees become confused because the branding seems to only yeah. attract and target people to the mothership or to the large institution because that's the logo. Uh, and that's, you know, spoken to other places that are part of kind of larger systems and you know, like that is, you know, it's a valid concern and I guess we have to just um, continue to just, like you said, piggyback on their message. Well, I think it's an interesting example, too, of uh, disjointed departments versus larger departments, right? I think there are some academic departments in the country who have programs sponsored at numerous hospitals, and then there are some health systems that have numerous separate departments. And when there are numerous separate departments, then it becomes, I agree with you, a challenge to help each of them have their own identity and their whole brand image and all the other things that unfold. You know, if UCSF has a single program, I'm sorry, a single department, and they can message both for Fresno and for the Moffitt San Francisco General Campuses. You know, to even say you know, there's more than one UCLA program, but it's one academic department. Mm -hmm. You're not you're not in this direct competition, but you're more aligned. And I, and I think that's an interesting an interesting workshop in and of itself for court to talk about because that is a, great idea. a new reality of of enlarging health systems that we're going to absorb like the Borg. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That was a Star Trek reference. <laughs> Love Star Trek references. <laughs> you will be assimilated. Yeah. <laughs> Resistance is futile. Cool. I have to say, Mike and Jeremy, this was really fantastic. I, I you know, I, I've actually heard this talk, a, a version of this talk before, and it still makes me think, and I still feel like I've learned a lot from you. Thanks, Thank Louis. So our slide, much. <laughs> I hope it didn't seem the same. It, was, yeah. it didn't. It didn't. It didn't at all. And I have to say, you know, it's, it's something, it's provocative for all of us to think about how do we do what we do and what, what, how, how um, mindful are we about what we're actually doing? Yeah. I think thank you yeah. for the opportunity and inviting us. Yeah, Fiona, thank you very much. Thank you, Corey, for this. And thank you, everybody, for attending with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.